This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. And I'm joined this week by my special uh, guest co-host, uh, Jerry Strickmatter. Who, Hi, Jerry, you're a board member for Susquehanna Valley Center and a former state legislator, a member of the House uh, from Lancaster County. Thanks very much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me here. I always learn a lot and looking forward to it. Well, this particular week we have some very special guests with us. Uh, we have another Susquehanna Valley board member and a former member of the state Senate who is now serving as the president and CEO of Blackford Ventures out of Lancaster County, Mike Brubaker. Mike, welcome back to the show. Charlie and Jerry, great to be with you. Thank you. And it's, I think, Suzanne, we had you once a long, long time ago. Uh, you've been with the National Federation of Independent Businesses as the state communications director uh, for over three years now. Yes. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome you to the show as Thank well. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to be here. Welcome. Well, today we'd like to talk about uh, small businesses and some of the... Uh, obstacles that small businesses uh, face. And that's pretty important, Jerry, when we look at most jobs throughout America are actually found in small to medium-sized businesses. Yeah, it's wonderful we have the experts here to talk about the overregulation and all the problems that they have because, let's face it, everybody's concerned about their job. Everyone's worried about the fact that they haven't gotten any increases. Every business is concerned that they can't raise their payrolls, you know, and help the people that are helping, you know, move the economy forward. So it's great to have two experts here to talk about what, what's going on and what things we need to be addressing and educate all our viewers across the state. Well, Mike and Suzanne, one of the things that we see that seems to be a new obstacle to businesses is that different cities are adopting their own rules and regulations regarding, um, regarding work and regarding uh, businesses. Could you talk about that? Who'd like to start out uh, here? I'd be happy to uh, explain some of them. There is a pattern across the country things that don't seem to go through a state legislature, the folks who are proponents of it are going to cities where they may get a better audience. So you may know some of them, of course, there would be, say, minimum wage, some of Seattle, San Francisco, you're familiar with that. The mandated leave bills that require private business to offer a set amount of sick time or leave time, we have that in Philadelphia, and there was one recently passed in Pittsburgh, and that now is overturned and on appeal, which NFIB is involved in that legal case. But we have two very interesting ones people here in Pennsylvania may not be aware of. One is what's called Ban the Box. You gentlemen heard about Ban the Box? You familiar Please with Please tell that? us more. Okay. I don't know if you recall, but when I was a teenager and filling out those applications at the fast food joint, there's that box, have you committed a felony? And uh, the proponents of this bill want to remove that and require that the employer only learn if the person has committed a felony at the point where they're actually doing an interview with them. And the reason behind it, obviously, is somewhat honorable because a large group of people are having tough time getting a job and back into the workforce after con being convicted of a felony. But on the other hand, a small business, they don't have an HR department for the most part. They have to interview all those different people who've applied and so it makes it very difficult when they may feel that does not fit well with their small business to have to wait to that point. It's an administrative nightmare and we just don't think that it's appropriate to mandate something like uh, that. I'd like, I'd like to follow up on mm -hmm. that. Are you telling me then that child predators can go to businesses that deal with children and the businesses don't know about their, their past record? Now, that is probably taken out in the specific bill that is passed. But it's hard to say whether your business, uh, you know, maybe it has some fiduciary element to it, and that person may have been involved in some felony that related to money, and they may or may not write that out in the ordinance, but there are, there are some, of, there is some of that in some of the bills, but overall, it's a generally bad policy because who's to decide whether you should be spending all that time interviewing and calling through resumes when it may not be the fit that you want? Oh my gosh, we have, we have 20, over 2,600 municipalities in our mm -hmm. Commonwealth. Well, this, Correct? And, and, and this yes. would, each one, what you're saying, is each one could come up with their own standards. 
Correct. Now, there, you've just touched upon something really significant, which is this balkanization. It's like a patchwork quilt. If every jurisdiction in Pennsylvania has a different law, each one is somewhat different, no matter what they are in labor rules, what a confusion. People won't be able to follow it. Let's say you have a business in a city. Well, you're on a different playing field than the guy right over the border. The pizza place here, the pizza place here. Goodness gracious, that hurts you. What if you have several locations of your business? How do you keep track? Uh, you have to hire somebody at another Mike, cost. Mike, you were, you were state senator <coughs> for many years, did a great job representing Lancaster County. And he, could you address this? How is this even possible? There's something in a constitutional law called Dillon's Rule uh, that has supposedly been agreed upon across the country, and that is that all local and regional governments are the creatures of state government, and the state government has the final say. But yet it doesn't appear that way in practice when we look at, Suzanne talked about the rules and new rules in Pittsburgh. What's going on here, and how difficult does this make business startups, Mike? Well, uh, I'm thrilled to hear this conversation because I think the viewers, I hope the viewers are, are listening and, and paying attention because this is a problem that really does need to be resolved. So we are a significant employer. Uh, I work for Blackford Ventures. The Blackford Companies is a larger regional company. And so we are doing business all across the state. So as a company that does business across the state, tries to make jobs, build buildings, uh, get the economy going again, it's literally impossible for any business to understand where all these new rules and regulations are in all these local jurisdictions. So we do need, uh, thank goodness we have NFIB, the Pennsylvania Chamber and others to help brief us as, as to uh, the, the, the rules of the land before we enter a new piece of ge uh, geography. But it's very, very complex. And, and, and as a develop, again, as a, the development part of our company, uh, we go through it's years and years of permits and regulatory control. Mm -hmm. In order to do a development, sometimes we need to improve a road a mile north and a mile south. Sometimes we have to buy right away from private landowners and private transaction to improve a road that was deficient by development that occurred well before us. So everybody wants, Republicans, Democrats alike, all want the economy to grow. And what I think what we're trying to say is there's these barriers to, to, the, to the growth of, of the economy. And I love when Susan said a lot of these, these laws or rules or ordinances start in good faith. Someone's actually trying to fix a problem, but they take this, this relatively unique problem, make a law across the entire jurisdiction or the, enti or the entire state, and it's an overreach. Now, it's, now there's a real uh, regulatory cost. And maybe unintended consequences. But you know, you made a point that struck a chord with me because a lot of our business owners say with all of this regulatory bur burden, the long waits for permits, these other laws, they say, I would never start this business today. And that's a worry because our entrepreneurs who are excited about it when they see all of these things they have to do just to hire one employee, to build a building, to buy land. It's really just too much, and it's going to discourage the economy. And to put a point on Suzanne's great comment is um, as some people that have been in our development company business for th over 30 years tell me the story that 30 years ago they could go into a local community's uh, uh, zoning office and walk out with a permit. <laughs> walk in, fill out a form, pay a $10 fee or whatever it was, fill the form out, and walk out with a permit and start to develop. It's unthinkable today. It, it, you're right, Charlie. It's become, <laughs> now it's two, three years. You have to hire attorneys. You have to have uh, all these, all these uh, accountants and uh, land planners and uh, environmental studies have to be done in many cases. It's, and the, the fact is uh, these rules were, again, made for a legitimate reason, but they've gone simply too far. Well, it's my understanding, no too, benefit analysis it's my understanding, too, that through this course of time, you're talking about 30 years ago, it's no surprise then that over 20 years ago, there were groups that got formed to try to do exactly what's happening now. So they've been working for 20 years in order to bring about this chaos for whatever reasons they have. What, what should we be telling our viewers to tell their local elected officials to be aware of, of these groups? you know, that, that are sowing the seeds of, of, of these problems. I mean, you talked about the unintended consequences. Yes. What, what are you telling your businesses to tell their customers and what should we be telling our viewers today uh, to be aware of and to warn uh, their municipalities about? Well, I think it's really important, first of all, that the message get out. 
like you're helping us do today. And I try to do that on a daily basis. And we activate our employees with grassroots writing campaigns to their lawmakers. But you know, there is a bill in the state legislature that would preempt, at least in the case of mandated leave, all these different jurisdictions from uh, having different rules that make it so much harder to survive as a small business. So we're advocating for that bill. And that might help at least in the mandated leave situation. And if constituents then are talking to not just their local officials, but now you're talking about their state legislators. Yes. Well, what's that bill number or what committee is it in or what, what's the common name the so they would know to talk to their legislators? Uh, it's changed a few times as it's come back and back, but I will tell you that the status of it was that it passed, uh, I believe, a Senate committee and it's at the door of the other committee as it stands now. Um, it's a Senate bill, but I believe Seth Grove, a House member, was promoting it and behind it. Okay, thanks. When did this balkanization begin? Uh, when did cities begin to uh, decide that they wanted to each have their own unique rules and regulations regarding businesses and labor and industry? Um, is there a point in time that stands out uh, across the country or here in Pennsylvania? I throw that open to both of you. I'm not sure that I know that there's a time. I think what has happened, though, w to describe perhaps how it became so, is that the groups, uh, and in large part, you even see it now, there is a national organization for that 10-10 minimum wage from the president on down, often in you know democratic uh, circles. But it is rather organized, and I think that those people really realized when they weren't able to etch their way in at the state level that this was a, a way to go. And so you've seen it out on the West Coast more frequently. I think it maybe was more prominent and began then, but that has been going on for, what, 15, 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Members of the State General Assembly just need to be made aware that when they're a being asked to vote for a new a bill to become law that fixes a problem, they need to be inquisitive enough to ask employers, ask NFIB, ask the Pennsylvania Chamber, ask other organizations, ask the employers in their districts, how might this uh, bill, if implemented into law, adversely affect you? Those kinds of questions lawmakers ought to be asking their constituents on a regular basis. Well, it seemed to be a time when Dillon's rule prevailed and there was some uh, coherence in uh, state and local government, and that's being lost now with organizations like, I recently learned of an organization called the Second American Revolution, working uh, primarily in Washington, D.C., but they believe that uh, local governments should be allowed to do whatever they want to do, um, irrespective of what the states might say. I don't know, have you run into that organization, or what, where's this movement taking us, guys? Uh, I will say one thing interesting. I'm not terribly aware of them, but I do know it is an organized effort. But you had mentioned there had been this, was it Dylan's Dylan's rule. Dylan's rule. In the case of Pittsburgh and the mandated leave, uh, they do have home rule, and another similar case had been overturned when they passed it as a result of that. But in this instance related to mandated leave, they were able to circumvent the current law by going through their health regulations because apparently the whole idea of mandated leave if you're in a restaurant and it, uh, an employee is ill they have a cold they're sick and oh they might sneeze in your soup because they're not given leave and so they use that vehicle to get the the um, ordinance passed one thing i'd interject and just ask uh, i would believe that this isn't just businesses you know that are concerned with this uh, but unions also would be concerned with this because if, as you say, Mike, projects aren't getting started, then that means they don't have work as well. So I think it is a, a bipartisan uh, or nonpartisan uh, issue, isn't it? Uh, I think clearly it's just been creeping up uh, it, in our lifetimes when we were born. When we were born uh, there was no EPA. EPA is about 25 years old. Can you even begin to imagine no? A federal regulatory uh, department overseeing the environment well and how active they are now and how many tens of thousands of people and how many actions are being taken on a regular basis so we have the, we've had this government creep going on for a long time and the viewers just need to understand there needs to be a stop to it there needs to be a slowdown of the, of the increase at least uh, because it's adversely affecting our economy and if everybody wants our economy to be better we un need to understand that these issues that Su Suzanne is speaking very well of and I 
have an adverse effect on job creation. I mean, you're trying to create jobs, and you've been doing that, Mike, for a good long time, and yet we have over 92 million unemployed people in America. Uh, I hear these reports of how the economy is getting better and improving, and it drives me wild because 92 million unemployed people in America, and I know you're out there trying to create jobs. This is a, been this is an increasing problem for you then. Well, if employers had a, a more flexibility in how they they um, uh, manage their own workforces, there would be a lot more of those 92 million people employed. There's no doubt about that. Let me give you a number that's sort of stunning. In, in 15 seconds or less. No problem. 81,000 pages of federal regulations put through last year. Ah, and on that note, <laughs> we'll wrap up this first segment, invite you both back. Uh, this is an important topic. We need to talk uh, a lot about unemployment. And we will see you right after this break. Stay tuned on Behind the Headlines. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions to make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Express, transporting construction, farm, and industrial equipment throughout the United States. And by Blackford Ventures, LLC, a private equity firm seeking to make significant investments in real estate, proven business enterprises, and their leaders. Find out more at www.blackfordventures.com. And by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On the second segment, Jerry and I are happy to welcome to the show Scott Bishop. Scott is the Senior Vice President of the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, it's nice to have you here to talk about health care continues to be one of the most important topics in state government. And of course, we are cobbling or attempting to cobble together another state budget at this very moment here on uh, Capitol Hill in Harrisburg. How did this most recently, I guess so we can say, approved state budget for last year, how did that end up impacting hospitals and health care in Pennsylvania? Well, it was a good budget for, for uh, Pennsylvania hospitals. The legislature, I know it was a long, difficult process uh, for them, but really uh, the, the legislative vehicles they put forth, um, they were all uh, about uh, equitable funding, uh, the right funding for hospitals. And so uh, we're glad to see that, that, uh, that their work you know, was ultimately enacted into law as the, as the state budget for the 15-16 uh, fiscal year. And they continue to do that same great work uh, in preparing for the 16-17 uh, fiscal year. So we're hopeful for an on-time budget. We're hopeful for a budget that continues the same funding uh, that the legislature started uh, in 15-16. And that we're hopeful we'll, we'll get there. So I think that, uh, you know, we're at that point in time where we have to wait and see how the next couple of weeks unfurl and, and that work that's that gets done, but we're off to the uh, on the right track uh, with the legislature. And I think I do think it's important that uh, we talk about the governor's uh, outlook. Uh, one of the things that we do think is the right way to to look at things is uh, he has talked about the uh, importance of maybe increasing some of the taxes related to tobacco use and and products that are a part of uh, you know the culture these days. And and hospitals have always thought that that's a that's an appropriate place to look for you know, using tax as a disincentive to, uh, you know, what are fairly um, unhealthy practices. So I think, generally speaking, we're looking, you know, as a, as a, as a, a very optimistic look at the 16-17 uh, budget from the perspective of hospitals, again, recognizing that there are a lot of challenges that legislators and the administration are looking at with regard to the big picture. But I think from a hospital perspective, uh, we feel pretty positive. Well, I know you and your members have been doing a good job, too, to help the legislature and the, the governor in order to you know, keep spending down, state spending down, yeah. by keeping spending down on health health care. Yeah. And one of those areas I know is the telehealth. And I know that would go a, 
a long way in trying to you know keep the increases of of spending down and maybe even have some savings that would then try to try to help us you know stay within our our current budget which helps the the legislature and, and the governor tell us more about the telehealth right so you're right about healthcare it's always changing and, and that's a positive thing because you know uh, whether it's technology uh, or it's bricks and mortar I mean hospitals and, and healthcare providers you know, are always trying to to stay ahead of, of what you know uh, they need to be doing and the telehealth component of that is is making sure that technology is used uh, to the best way it can be with regard to the health care needs of, of folks and it's and it's it's the same quality care that you get if you were walking into a physician's office or you go into a hospital in, in many cases but we just make good use of the technology that's that's available to us and um, why wouldn't we want to do that so I think it's one of those issues where it's happening now um, but uh, the the technology and, and the healthcare and the needs, they're kind of at one stage and the, the legislative process and some of the, you know, the minutia that goes with that is, is at a different stage and we need to, we're going to try to bring those two more, uh, more together. What are the practical uses, Scott, for telehealth? Yeah, so I think it, you can look at it a couple of different ways. I think, um, and starting at the most important, I mean, telehealth is a life-saving um, process for healthcare. And I'll give you a very easy example. Uh, we refer to as telestroke. So um, if you think when, when a person has a stroke, um, think of it this way, there are just about two billion or two million uh, brain cells die each minute that a stroke is, is happening, right? And so the difference uh, in, is really in minutes when it comes to trying to care for a patient like that. And what telestroke does is it, if, a, if a patient comes to a hospital that doesn't have a neurosurgeon, um, that hospital can, you know, can use technology to have a, a, you know, basically a neurosurgeon come right into the room with the emergency department physician, the nurses, and then help that physician and nurse on site um, assess what's going on with the patient, uh, you know, ensure that it is a stroke, uh, go through the battery of tests, and then help that patient understand here's what the best course of treatment would be for you right on the, right on the spot and then you either get the patient if he or she's able to do so or their family or whatever to make that decision. And you know, the difference um, can mean a patient walking out of an emergency department a you know, day or two later versus spending you know, years in a rehabilitation facility or something because, because the treatment protocols weren't you know, initiated when they could have been. And so that's, that's probably the most dramatic example of, of um, telehealth. A second um, important example is uh, if you think about teledermatology, you know, we all, you know, I'm fair skinned, so, you know, every now and then there's, you know, things happening while you should get that looked at, and, but it's a hassle, you know, you have to wait for a dermatologist or especially that, you know, there are not a lot of them. And so the idea of teledermatology is, you know, being able to take a picture of, you know, whatever the, you know, the uh, surprising thing is, and you, <laughs> and you send a picture, and, and you know, nine times out of ten, maybe it's, oh, you, look, it's a normal whatever, the next time you can make a, an appointment to come in, great. Or it could be something where a dermatologist would say, hey, that has, that looks like it might be something, we should try to get you in, and, you know, preventative care and stuff like that is, is, is always important. Um, we have tele-urgent care, you know, uh, that's a kind of a new trend and, and when you can't get in to see your family doc, you might go to an urgent care center. Uh, we've got uh, hospitals and health systems that have uh, that process and where, you know, again, you're not going to, if a physician needs to see you, you know, if you need to be seen in person, they're going to say, hey, this is something you need to see. But uh, maybe it's something you can, instead of going and waiting in line and seeing those, you know, you can queue, go in the queue, you can have something looked at. Um, so there's all those kinds of things. And then to just the normal, you know, we've, we're a country where I think we're at the two thirds of us are using smartphones. And, you know, there's a lot of aspects of telehealth, um, you know, where you could go and just have regular appointments, regular things that you're doing just right with your phone. So all those are different ways in which telehealth can improve the uh, health care of, of folks and, it, and improve costs in any number of different ways. Every time you don't have to, you know, the expense of driving, traveling, whatever the case is. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in which it does that, but that's that's it. I mean, it, and and again, it's it's all about making sure patients have the right care at the right place at the right time. Not substituting if you need to be seen in a facility or you need to be seen by a physician, um, but you know, for those times where you could do it from the comfort of your own home, we want to try to do. Yeah, that. definitely have to you know commend you and the association and the uh, 
all the all your members, all the hospitals out there for you know using those dollars wisely. A lot of times there's you know criticism about the fact, well, you're nonprofit or your healthcare, you're you're making money off of the sick, but yeah. you need to have those reserve funds. You need to be making money to be able to go back and reinvest, uh, as you just talked about. Yeah. You know, getting people out of the emergency room queue, where that's the most expensive care into the urgent care, that took a lot of money from the hospitals to do that and to reach out to the community and also with this telehealth. So yeah. I want to th thank you and, the, and, and all, the, all the hospitals for doing that. I think you need to do a better job, though, at communicating that yeah. you know, to all the citizens across the state. But hopefully this, this show will do that, right. that that's the reason that you need to have those reserves. Technology is not inexpensive. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's healthcare or anything else. And I think hospitals are making those investments. And part of the need for legislation is to ensure that there's uh, that there's reimbursement and coverage from insurers on 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 these issues, because listen, hospitals they're gonna they want to do these these services. They want to make sure that if a stroke patient comes to emergency department, they have a way to have a, a neurologist come in and, and be a part of that. But it, you're right; it's an investment. It it, it, it um, if they if they're investing in that, then then it's hard for them to keep spreading those costs above all the different around all the different services that need to do. And so that's one of the key aspects of the legislation, which is to say, look. Um, we think that insurers should cover, you know, whether or not they're walking in and seeing the neurologist uh, right by the bedside or if they're being, you know, uh, in the room via technology, that that, that should be covered um, in a like manner. So it's a, it's a key aspect. Scott, you're one of the most important individuals in the association to uh, deal with the relationship between the association and all your members and state government. Um, what are the pieces of legislation in regard to telehealth that you are keeping an eye on at the Hill right now? What if you were speaking to the legislators that are watching, or some of the uh, some of our um, some of our viewers? Yeah. Uh, which ones would you single out? So we've got two great champions at the moment: uh, one in the Senate, one in the House. Senator Elder Vogel from uh, Beaver County in the northwestern part of the Commonwealth, and Marguerite Quinn in the southeastern suburbs who are right now working on legislation that to introduce, we don't have our bill yet, but to introduce that would allow for kind of three main components, uh, kind of defining what telehealth is, um, making sure uh, who provides telehealth, you know, some licensure, things like that, and then the kind of the reimbursement side of things. And so right now we're working with stakeholders, uh, physicians, insurers, others, to try to get us to a place where, where those bills can actually, you know, start to move forward in the legislative process. But we're, we're fortunate because we've been across the Commonwealth talking to um, our members and legislators, you know, giving them real live examples of, of telehealth and, mm -hmm. and they get it and they understand it and they're like, yeah, this is, a, this is kind of a no-brainer mm -hmm. uh, and now it's just a matter of getting, as the legislative process, as you know, right. getting all those details in, in the place. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Unfortunately, we're out of time already. Uh, the time always slips by way too quickly. Uh, we hope you'll come back sure. very soon and uh, give us an update. And we'll be back next week with all of you to give you an update on Behind the Headlines. Tune in then. <laughs>